Greetings and welcome to Conversations at Noon on the Connecticut Freedom Trail. I'm Tammy Denise. In 1995, the General Assembly established the Connecticut Freedom Trail as a way to recognize African Americans and other marginalized populations fight for freedom, social equality in Connecticut, and to mark sites that bear witness to milestones in that quest. Today, we have three speakers with us, and they're going to talk about the importance of Venture Smith. We're going to um, have Dr. Carl Stafko. He is the town historian of East Haddam and the expert on the Venture Smith family genealogy. He is going to talk to us today about how Venture, start, how Venture Smith Day started, which comes up in September. And he started this 25 years ago. And how the annual event in East Haddam has grown each year to include new scholarship and new discovered dis then we will also hear from Elizabeth Wood or Liz Wood. From, um, she's executive director of the Stonington Historical Society, and it operates two museums, the Lighthouse Museum and the Captain Nathaniel B. Palmer House. But they are going, but she is going to be specifically speaking about the exhibit that has been installed about Venture Smith. And then we are going to hear from Elizabeth Norman. She is the founding publisher and executive editor of the Connecticut Explorer. Uh, magazine. It is award-winning public history magazine, and it is in print and online. And she also co-edited African American Connecticut Explored, as well as Venture Smith's Colonial Connecticut. So now I will turn it over to Dr. Carl Stafko. Thank you so very much for being with us today. Thank you for asking me. I'm going to be talking today on Venture Smith Day, then and now. In the beginning, in 1971, the First Church of Christ Congregational in East Haddam, of which I am a member, asked me to take care and oversee the management of First Church Cemetery, a volunteer job I still held. While surveying the cemetery, I met Venture Smith for the first time and was surprised to find that no one in the church or the town of East Haddam knew anything about him, except for a retired school teacher. Helen Cobley. Seeking more information about Venture, she pointed me to his 1798 narrative, a copy of which is housed at the local library, and to the Wormsley family of Middletown, whom she said were descendants. Thus began a 50-year adventure to discover Venture's genealogy of descendants and new discoveries about his life from land, probate, and court records and from his family's traditional stories. By 1996, I had traced nine of 11 generations of descendants. That year, film crews from public television began to arrive to film Venture's gravestone and interview some of the Wormsley descendants for a Connecticut Freedom Trail documentary. It seemed without even knowing it, Venture's gravesite had been put on the list of the newly created Connecticut Freedom Trail sites. This was cause for an event. The descendants decided on a family reunion for September, which was designated as Freedom Trail Month. Meanwhile, the cemetery board added music by the Moodus Drum and Fife Corps, a ribbon cutting ceremony by the late state representative Linda Orange, a town proclamation, a family photo of descendants present around Venture's grave, and, of course, refreshments. It was a success, with 40 descendants attending. The family then asked us to do it again the following year. We did and have continued to do so for the last 25 years. Only three times did rain cause an issue, as in 2004, when Hurricane Ivan struck and we had to move into the church sanctuary. The speakers showed up, as did 17 stalwart descendants and Venture Smith fans. Despite the failure of the electricity, we carried on. Spreading the word, I began giving lectures to the middle school students in town on Venture's life. Then Andrea Pascal, a teacher at that school, took up the task each year until she retired. Her students provided drawings of the events in Venture's life to put up on the walls of the cemetery shed on Venture Smith Day. And they also recited poems about Venture written by local resident and state poet laureate, Marilyn Nelson. 
More recently, we supported State Representative Bobby Gibson Jr. of Bloomfield with affidavits in his successful attempt to create a mandate in the state statutes that African-American history be taught in all public schools in the state. We look forward to seeing how many students sign up for the course locally this fall. More recently, we have been lucky to have African quilts made by the Sisters in Stitches joined by the cloth of Eastern Massachusetts, decorating the walls of the cemetery shed. Their president, Susie Ryan, is a Venture Smith descendant. Over the years, I have given talks at Venture Smith Day on what was new with Venture in the previous year, and also under the general title of Reading Between the Lines, stories about Venture's family, his life gleaned from land, probate and court records, and also local and state histories. We have been fortunate that many important historians and authors have been guest speakers on Venture Smith Day over the years. Besides the descendants themselves, they are the late Barbara Barnes, author of Venture Smith's Family, Anne Farrow, author of The Log Books, Allegra de Bonaventura, author of For Adam's Sake, Chandler Saint of the Documenting Venture Smith Project, Robert P. Forbes of the Gilder Lehrman Center at Yale, Robert Hall of Northeastern University, Dr. Linda Strasbau of the DNA Project at UConn, David Richardson of the Wilberforce Institute in Hull, England, Dr. Akusua Purby of the University of Ghana, Jesse Nasta of Wesleyan, Marta Daniels of Chester, author of Hidden in Plain Sight, Dr. Lucianne Lavin, author of The Venture Smith Homestead, John Wood Sweet, author of Bodies Politic of the University of North Carolina, Dr. Nancy Steenberg of UConn, and archaeologists Dr. Nicholas Bellantoni of UConn and Warren Perry of CCSU. Notable happenings over the years. Firstly, we created a quilt square in 1998 for the Eastern Regional Connecticut Freedom Trail quilt, which is housed in the State Museum. Next, a bus trip for the descendants to Venture's home site on Haddam Neck was organized in 2003. We arranged to have Venture's wooden storage chest brought to Winter Tour in Delaware by Marta Daniels and John Wood Sweet in 2013 for age verification with positive results. We received an official citation from the Connecticut General Assembly in 2015 for bringing Venture's life out into the public. The descendants exhibit of their 2014 trip to Ghana to see the slave castle at Anamabu is still a featured exhibit each Venture Smith Day. We also assisted in promoting the archaeological survey done by Drs. Lucianne Lavin and Mark Banks at Venture's home site on Haddam Neck. That was in 2001. When the Wormsley family found out that the nuclear waste from the decommissioned Connecticut Yankee Atomic Energy Plant was to be stored temporarily at the southern end of Venture's farm, they sued to have the nuclear waste stored elsewhere. I submitted an affidavit to the court on their behalf. The suit failed, however, and the nuclear waste is still stored on Hadamick today, almost 20 years later. Likewise, in 2006, we assisted in promoting the archaeological dig at Venture's gravesite in an attempt to uncover his DNA. However, a lawsuit was filed by those who did not want Venture's body desecrated. The suit was brought against the family of descendants who requested the dig and the cemetery association. The lawsuit failed, but when all was said and done, no usable DNA was recovered. In 2018, best-selling author Russell Shorto published Revolution Song about the revolutionary period lives of five men, including Venture Smith and one woman. 
Mr. Shorto had accompanied the descendants to Ghana and spent a full year on and off with me researching the life of Venture. I was particularly pleased that he utilized parts from 15 of my Venture Smith Day's stories about Venture in his book. Most recently, we have helped Bill Sullivan of Suffield Academy with genealogic research on Venture's daughter-in-law, Tamar, for a witness stone to celebrate her life as a former slave of the Loomis family in Suffield. We are also hoping to work on placing witness stones here in East Tatum in the near future. Venture Smith Day today. This year's Venture Smith Day is Saturday, September 10th from 1 to 4 p.m. in First Church Cemetery on Town Street, Route 151 in East Tatum, where our speakers will be myself, Elizabeth Wood, Executive Director of the Stonington Historical Society, Thomas Thurston, Director of Education and Public Outreach at the Gildo Lehrman Center for the Study of Slavery, Resistance, and Abolition at Yale, and ninth generation descendant Amina R. Merritt Esquire of Sacramento, California. After the speakers, <clears throat> the wreath laying ceremony and the photo of Venture's descendants at his gravesite, the program will move to the East Haddam Historical Society Museum on Town Street, Route 82, to view the Venture Smith exhibit there, including his wooden storage chest and the recently dedicated life-size wooden carved and painted statue of Venture by Weymouth Eustace of Chester and Frank Todaro of Montana. Exhi exhibits will be on view, refreshments served, and books and other items will be for sale. All are welcome. Please bring a comfortable lawn chair or blanket. In case of rain, we will move into the sanctuary of the church. Thank you for your attention. Hi everyone, I'm Elizabeth Wood, or Liz Wood. I wanna say thank you for having me here today and I'm quite honored to be in such illustrious company today. So I'm the executive director of the Stonington Historical Society. This is a position I've held more or less for the past, well, since 2015, but a little bit more on that later. We recently installed a permanent exhibit on the life of Venture Smith at the Lighthouse Museum here in Stonington. And I just wanna talk a little bit about why the story is important to share with our visitors, because every day we get visitors who question the very existence of slavery in the North, as well as the quality of life for those enslaved people here in the North. Um, why Stonington? Um, Venture Smith had strong ties to Stonington and a good part of his narrative relates to stories that happened here, including episodes of abuse and violence, but also extraordinary life events for an enslaved man and his family. I wanna point out that by no means are Venture Smith's life experiences typical of an enslaved person in Stonington or in New England. He really um, experienced some extraordinary successes, but there's also a lot of heartache and um, a lot of hard work in that story as well. Um, in Stonington, Venture Smith was enslaved. He was bought and sold. Um, he eventually was able to purchase his own freedom and that of his family here in Stonington. Most of his children were born here. He bought and sold property. He built a home here and even successfully, successfully sued his former owner in the legal system here in Stonington. He appears several times in the historical record. And even though once he was able to reunite his family, um, he, he left Stonington and went to East Haddam. Um, so, but he did, he did come back um, to gather his wife and children. Um, the Lighthouse Museum um, is the site we chose to install this exhibit, not only because it's our most visited site, we also operate the Captain Palmer House and the Woolworth Library and Research Center here in Stonington, but the Lighthouse has far more visitors and the greatest impact would, have, would be felt by putting this in, 
at the lighthouse. Also from the Lighthouse Museum, you are able to see Barn Island, which is the site we believe that Venture Smith built his house on and owned property on. So the exhibit room um, has a window that looks out over that site. And that is actually pointed out in the exhibit itself. We, um, we knew Venture's story and we um, explored it and celebrated it for a long time um, in other ways, not, not necessarily an exhibit. We've had a long relationship with Professor Nancy Steenberg and her assistant was Elizabeth Kading. They have been conducting research on Venture Smith for many years. Um, they've written articles and given programs and offered annual walking tours to the alleged home site on Barn Island. Her research identified the land um, she believed was owned by Venture Smith. That was later refined by Marta Dan Daniels. Um, but Nancy had made Venture Smith a priority for research for many years. She is a past board member of the Historical Society, so she spent a lot of time using the records in our research center. We had spent some time on a temporary exhibit with museum curator Beth Moore. Um, we also have had several conversations with Carl Stofko, who was always encouraging us to do something related to Venture Smith. Carl is a great advocate for the story, as you can see, um, and he had been exploring the story for years previously. But it wasn't until a funding opportunity um, from the State Department of Economic and Community Development was released, it was called the Good to Great Grant, that we were able to fully explore the story and literally able to dig in deeper. The Good to Great Grant was made possible for small organizations like the Stonington Historical Society that had small staffs, small budgets, and little access to major state funding. At the time, our Director of Development, Chris Keppel, was intrigued and he had had a recent conversation with Carl Stofko. At the time, we were in the throes, or the beginning of the throes of a capital campaign for the Lighthouse Museum and had very little of that money earmarked for exhibits. So this was a great opportunity to um, contribute to the campaign, but also to, to look at a facet that had not been considered before. The DECD was looking for innovative projects that would go beyond facilities, repairs, or expansions. They were looking for projects that would provide new means of telling stories in meaningful ways. And Chris saw a real opportunity. Um, we had repeated conversations and many, many drafts, all the while um, talking with Todd Levine from the State Historic Preservation Office, and eventually we applied for the grant, which including matching funds was for a total of $75,000, which was an extraordinary amount of money for this organization um, dedicated to an exhibit. So the project would have three components and each were funded equally. The first was an archeological survey of the identified home site and surrounding plot of land that, was, that we believed had been owned and the home site constructed by Venture Smith. Research heritage consultants conducted a phase one archeological survey of the 15.7 acres um, we had identified, um, as well as the, the, the homestead itself. This is a comprehensive first look. Um, it includes a pedestrian survey, so just walking through the site, photo documentation, mapping. They determined that the site was relatively undisturbed um, and thought it was intact and undisturbed from the 18th century. And then they began digging in the dirt. So they dug a total of 185 shovel test pits. And what they found was an assemblage of domestic artifacts, including pottery shards and glass fragments and um, pieces of clay pipe stains, stems. And what this means is they confirmed occupation of the site during the time that we believe Venture Smith lived here. This is important um, to the historical record. Um, the nar narratives of enslaved African Americans have been questioned for years and years. And this was concrete confirmation of Venture Smith's own words and his narrative, as well as um, it confirmed occupation of the site during the time that we believe Venture lived there as well. The second part of the grant um, funded research and we hired Dr. Nancy Steenberg and Elizabeth Kading to conduct a thorough uh, review of all documents in our own library and in our own town records related to enslaved people here in Stonington. 
They um, did a meticulous survey of ledgers, account books, court records, newspapers, diaries, um, selectmen's records um, as well. They reviewed birth and death records, church records, land records, and probate records. Um, so, and they, what they did is document um, not just Venture Smith's um, presence in the historical record, but that of other enslaved and free African-American people here in Stonington. They also found evidence of uh, whitewashing of the town records. There were two um, uh, town clerk books and one was being copied over and they think this happened in the early 20th century and they were leaving out all evidence of enslaved people. So that was also an important addition to the record and what we know about Stonington as well. And then the last part of this project um, involved the design and installation of a permanent exhibit. Um, we hired Michael Hankey and design division from Amherst, Massachusetts. Um, and well, at first I should say, I um, left the Historical Society um, just as we had sent out the request for proposals and returned about a year later as the exhibit was coming um, into shape. So it was almost like I had never left. In the meantime, there was a pandemic and things were moving slow. So um, it, I was really happy to be here to see it all come together. So the exhibit was installed in November of 2021 and it's called My Freedom is a Privilege That Nothing Else Can Equal. These are the very words of Venture Smith that he, that's quoted from his narrative. It's very powerful um, words as well. Um, but in creating an exhibit, I mean, you're, you have to translate those words into something compelling and visual for people to see. Working with Michael Hankey, we talked about what we had in the historical record. One of the most descriptive pieces was um, the runaway ad when Venture Smith ran away from his owner Mumford from Fisher's Island. Um, it described the clothing he was wearing, what he was carrying, and we made the decision to use textiles as um, the background of our exhibit panels. Um, we start with kente cloth, so the exhibit panels explore his life in a series of consecutive panels, and they're numbered for so that you know where to start in the museum. There are visuals, there's um, maps, um, as well as a, a runaway ad, but along the bottom of the exhibit runs a timeline with short, with small icons that are right at a children's eye level. Um, it incorporates, um, we've mapped out a space on the floor that that is the size of what a enslaved person would be allocated on a slave ship as well. Um, and then we um, included uh, things from our own collections, not necessarily related to Venture Smith, but we do have sets of handcuffs and manacles that we included. And we have some family Bibles that talk about um, enslaved people in those families as well. So we use textiles like the calico that Venture was sold for initially. So we have a piece of that on display as well as the, a small, um, wooden cask for molasses. Um, that was his purchase price. Michael Hankey um, worked um, here in Stonington for the Meshantucket Pequot Museum previously, so he was very familiar with the landscape here and with the story already. So we opened this exhibit in February. We opened officially in February of 2022 um, we for, at, for um, Black History Month, and we offered free admission for the entire month. and we saw unprecedented visitation. We had over a thousand visitors visit the Lighthouse Museum in the middle of winter um, during snowstorms, um, ice covered sidewalks and things. So it was clear that there is um, a great appetite for this story. Um, we included components for people to uh, give feedback on um, index cards and have great meaningful comments from children as well as adults who, who didn't know the story of enslavement in Connecticut, New England, or even Stonington. So um, it's had a real impact, I think, on our local community as well as Southeastern Connecticut. Some of our next steps are um, an application to the Connecticut Freedom Trail um, is next, but we've also hired um, a museum educator who is working on curriculum 
and field trip um, post pre and post visit materials so that we can um, encourage school groups to visit the museum or at least take advantage of online resources. So um, I'm looking forward to the next steps um, as well as Venture Smith Day in September. So thank you very much. Hi everyone, I'm Elizabeth Norman, um, founding publisher of Connecticut Explored, the magazine of Connecticut history. I've just stepped down as publisher after 20 years and we've appointed a new publisher, Kathy Hermes, and we're really excited about that. Uh, but I have uh, gotten involved in the last number of years in creating educational resources for uh, students uh, based on Connecticut Explored's vast back history of, of stories and such. And one of the projects we did was this book, African American Connecticut Explored. We did this with uh, in 2014 with the Amistad Center for Art and Culture. It took about 25 stories of African American history from the magazine and we added material, we commissioned material. We worked with three African American scholars who are co-editors on that. And that book is a fantastic kind of survey of the, what we called the long arc, the 300 plus years of the African American experience in Connecticut. And I think that might've been my first introduction to Venture Smith. So after we, I'm sorry, created a, um, sorry, I'm looking for a sample of it. Here we go. A, group, a, a book for third and fourth graders where I live, Connecticut. I was talking with, which we did with a couple of school uh, curriculum specialists. I said, well, what would you be interested in, in for fifth graders? And they said, well, a book about colonial Connecticut. And I was like, I don't know, Connecticut, colonial Connecticut, not really my period. But then I remembered Venture Smith. And I thought, what if children could learn about colonial Connecticut, the founding of our state from the voice of an African-American person? Like how extraordinary would that be? And the reason that that's even possible is that Venture Smith wrote, uh, published his, didn't write it, sorry. Carl will correct me on that. He published his narrative. Someone else wrote it down and published it for him. The Newtown B, the, yeah, I'm sorry, the B of New London um, in 1798. So we have his narrative and it, you know, as close as we can get to his words, his uh, telling of his life story from 1798. And that's extraordinary. So I'm just gonna give you a quick summary. And then I'm gonna talk to you a little bit more about how he adapted this for use with children. So um, I'm gonna sh actually share my screen because this might help. Um, I assume I share my screen. Yeah, okay, there we go, thank you. <laughs> All right, so Venture Smith's Colonial Connecticut. We call it a true story of freedom. So Venture Smith was uh, captured as a boy in West Africa, in Dukandara. He was the son of the leader of his village. His village was overrun by uh, an invading army, probably on behalf of a European slave trading nation, um, you know, England, Portugal, um, you know, number of them uh, uh, trading in, in slaves and gold and such in, in the period. He was marched to the coast. He was put on a ship. He was purchased by a uh, ship steward and put on a ship that came here to New England, first to Rhode Island, then to uh, grew, then grew up on Fisher's Island, which was part, then part of the New York, although it had originally been part of Connecticut. And then through a very long and uh, an incredibly fascinating life story, we learn about his experience growing up, coming of age, marrying, having children, um, his experience of being enslaved and then his experience uh, self-emancipating and then self-emancipating his family. And then in, in, in the end of his long life, uh, dying in a, you know, fairly successful, I mean, he was quite successful at one point as he gets older, you know, he, he runs into issues with becoming elderly. But, uh, you know, he uh, ended up his life with, you know, more than 100 acres of land in Haddam Neck and, um, you know, being pretty prosperous by any measure of the colonial period. So I'm really glossing over that super fast. But there's so much in this story, uh, and I always call it a, a true story of freedom. I also call this a book about colonial Connecticut because while it 
definitely includes the story of slavery in Connecticut, that's not everything that defines venture smith. And that's what's so wonderful about using this story for, for um, teaching children about, well, you know, what we're now calling the whole of the story, uh, the whole of the founding of the Connecticut history uh, of Connecticut's founding. So I'm going to just click through what this resource is all about. First of all, yeah, again, we're Connecticut Explored. We're a public history magazine. We come out quarterly. Uh, we, uh, I invite you to, to join us. You can get a free sample uh, from our ctexplore.org slash shop. You'll find an opportunity there, or we certainly hope you will just sign up and start getting the magazine. It's just all kinds of um, fantastic stories about Connecticut history. So uh, Venture Smith's Colonial Connecticut, it's a book about Colonial Connecticut based in this primary source, uh, Venture's own story published in 1798. It's suitable for grades five to eight, it for, uh, foregrounds the African-American voice uh, through his narrative, and it presents that history really from three perspectives, the Native American perspective, the African perspective, primarily Venture Smith's, but not only his, and then of course the English and the Dutch, the uh, English uh, settlers. And here's just quick for any teachers that are on our call. This is how it fits the grade five standards. It was really built for grade five, but I think it has um, really suitability up through grade eight, even at the high school level. Um, and even for adults, people who have read this book and picked it up have said they've learned something about, you know, they didn't know before. So this, it really is a, here, here, how do Americans define freedom and equality and how have American conceptions of freedom and equality changed over the course of time. And I won't, won't read all of these, but you can see how the state of Connecticut social studies frameworks are calling for fifth graders to really wrestle with and be introduced to these very um, complex and important issues of our history. So again, this is where I thought, well, Venture Smith tells us so much about this, uh, these issues. It's available in print. Um, I have a copy here. You can kind of see what it looks like. It's a little bit smaller than, sorry, where's my camera? Um, so it's a it's just a beautifully designed book, very accessible for, for kids. It's also available online. And so for use, you know, when during for a hybrid situation or during the pandemic, um, it was available online. If you didn't have kids in the classroom, you can kind of use it. It's very flexible in that regard. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about what's also on the companion website for teachers. So how did I make it suitable for a fifth grader? I did lightly revise it to the fifth grade reading level. But I, what I instituted something that I've not seen done before, but I thought was important. I used as many of his words as I could. And, if, and, any, and so I did the copy where his words are in bold. So it's, Students can always know when they are reading Venture Smith's words, and then they the regular type is where I might have where I did paraphrase it to make it easier to read. Um, I didn't, but I'm not a novelist; I'm a historian, so I did not add anything. I did not imagine what he was thinking. I didn't add dialogue. I simply lightly paraphrased so that it it is as close to his words while while making it accessible for students. So a closer look, you have, it comes, it's in four parts. The first part we meet Venture and these first two parts are based in his narrative. The chapters one through four talk about his capture, the middle passage that he survives, his forced arrival in the American colonies. You see these pictures here, these drawings I commissioned um, a Bloomfield artist to, uh, to, for five illustrations, including the cover illustration uh, by Michael Borders. Uh, he used his grandson as a model for the young venture. Um, so, and he's really kind of a historian himself as well as an artist. He did a beautiful job. Uh, part two is now when venture is in colonial America, grows up and enslaved, finds freedom, not finds it, but gets it for himself and his success. And again, so much of this book tells you how the colonial economy worked, which is part of the social studies curriculum. It's not just history. It's, it's also the economy, and he's particularly strong in explaining that to, to us and to students. And then parts three and parts four are the parts that I wrote. And these back us up into the first part, because Venture Smith is really here in the second half of the colonial period. 
So it backs us up to the beginning of the colonial period. So we talk about the Native American presence here, uh, the settlers and that conflict and how that evolved, how Native Americans uh, persisted and continued to be here and be a very important part of the colony. There are some primary source materials related to their story as well. Uh, and then the development of the colonial economy um, and, and, and the colony's development. And then there's a sec special section, the four, part four, really talks about slavery in colonial Connecticut. Some very, very particulars and details about that. Um, one of the examples of where I tried to bring in the Native American na uh, narrative is Samson Occam was a Mohegan and he became a, a minister. And so he uh, also published quite a bit of writings. And he has a wonderful short narrative of his description of his childhood in Mohegan. And then we have a longer piece on the primary, uh, in our white, I'm sorry, on our website's primary source library. So again, important to bring in multiple voices to understand. So children just learn about colonial Connecticut, understanding that while there's not the amount of diversity we have today, there was diversity at the beginning. There were Native Americans, there were multiple uh, European um, folks here, uh, Native Americans and of many tribes, you know, uh, at least a do dozen uh, tribes across Connecticut and then the Africans and African-Americans, of course, who also came from a number of different places and spoke different languages, and but brought their culture with them and, and, and retained that culture here and talks about that as well. Um, here's kind of a sample layout. Again, like um, Liz talked about in their exhibition, we have a kind of a timeline that, that runs through that. This explains how Venture's words are in bold. There's introductions and sidebars. Uh, lots of just, uh, it's a very rich text for giving kids a lot of uh, ability to, to access this narrative. There's, you know, charts and graphs, for example, this is in the last section about slavery in Connecticut, where we have some census data and um, a little chart that talks about when did each New England state and, and New York end slavery, which you'd be surprised if you haven't looked in this, I had to work really hard at this, is not an easy question to answer. Uh, it really varies by state. Um, on the website, we also have uh, lesson plans and professional development opportunities. We have a complete uh, curriculum that goes with the, the Venture Smith Colonial Connecticut. And then we have a couple of uh, smaller, sort of shorter lesson plans. Uh, one about the colonial economy, another about uh, using, uh, about, um, it's a more of an English language arts lesson plan about memoir and you know personal writing, that kind of thing. Uh, provide opportunities for integrated close readings. And we have and, and then we've added an entire section of primary source material to our website so that there's just a whole uh, just there's just incredible richness of, of resource here for, for teachers to use. We include a tips for teaching difficult history. Um, strategies, concepts, and resources to, to support productive, respectful discussions and learning with students about, uh, obviously, this very difficult history of slavery and Connecticut's role in it, which, you know, at a, at a fifth graders level, a lot of kids are going to be introduced to this for the very first time. Uh, th these are just some of the sources. We use many sources. The book at the, the, book ha at the end lists all of the sources I used to, to create this book because, again, as historians, it's important. There's been as you've heard from Carl and from Liz, there's been a lot of scholars who have dug into and worked to verify and find out more about Venture Smith's life. And so we, we just benefited from being able to utilize those, mat those materials in that research. Some really, uh, really excellent work. Um, always there's more we always want to know. And Carl's always great every year at Venture Smith Day. We're learning something new. He's always learning something new. And, and that's just such a wonderful thing. Again, a primary source library, an example, for example, uh, one example is we have this Mohegan petition of 1789 that is just such a beautifully written piece of writing about the Mohegan experience. In 1789, they're describing their existence here in the colonies and how it's been impacted by colonial settlement. Uh, just this little excerpt. Uh, for in times past, they had they, meaning the Mohegan, had no contention about their lands. It lay in common to them all 
and they ha had but one large dish and they could all eat together in peace and love. And it just is a, such a wonderful piece of writing that would explain to children an alternate way of living in a society in which everything was communal, where there was uh, really respect for and feel a, a spiritual attachment to the environment and to nature around them, as opposed to the colonists who came in and they divided up the land, they fenced it, they farmed it, they you know, created deeds. Uh, just a really interesting opportunity to explore different ways to create a, a civilization or a society and ultimately a state. So we have a lot of primary documents. They're scaffolded, obviously, so that, again, students can access them. We like to show the primary piece, and then we might have a transcription of it, and then maybe a summarization of it so that it's a little more accessible. Here's an example of uh, a deed to uh, Venture Smith's land that he signed that's in the Haddam Land rac Records. Uh, and, then, and then this would be transcribed and, and support provided. So, so kids can see that history is a real thing. There's real, there's evidence, there's places, you know, it's not just some story from the past. Adventure Smith was a real living, breathing person. Uh, you can find all of this at VentureSmithColonialCT.org um, and including, I think I have more information here. I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about what you find there. We did a pilot, when we came out with the book, we did a pilot um, with uh, a seventh grade in East Haddam and a fifth grade in Middletown. And we got some fantastic feedback from the students. And I just have two quotes here uh, that really told us that they found his story as compelling as we do as adults. And that they really connected with it and it helped them really connect to history in Connecticut, to the place that they live. Uh, so again, th their words made it really feel very compelling to offer this, this opportunity. Venture Smith, I think, to answer the question, why is this his story important, especially for children? I think when um, studying slavery can be uh, obviously upsetting and it can feel a little abstract and the people who lived it can it's very hard to get a sense of their who they were and their humanity because so little of their record has been left to us in history but we know they were living breathing caring loving ambitious hardworking. you know all those had all those qualities that that you, of the people that you know in your own life and through venture smith's narrative we really get such a strong sense that he had such a strong sense of self you see and you feel his humanity, his devotion to his family. His quest for freedom uh, is so important to us. He tells us what that means to him, as Liz mentioned in the, the exhibition title they're using in Stonington. Uh, throughout his life, he has agency. He shows resistance. But he's, he's complex, too. He buys several enslaved men, which might shock you. But he really does that as a means to, like himself, enable them to buy themselves out of slavery. And they run away and he feels cheated and he's kind of mad about it, but he doesn't pursue them because he doesn't see them as property he, or an investment. He sees them as fellow human beings and he's trying to help them to, to get on. So would he have liked to have gotten his money back? Sure, but um, you know, he kind of you know, gets mad about it and moves on. In some ways, he is a typical of a colonial person, colonial man, I should say, um, especially in the way that he talks about the work that he does and the way he makes money. Um, the colony is incredibly complex. There's no single currency. Uh, the, the way money works, there's bartering. There's um, He borrows, he's, he invests, and he borrows. I mean, it's, it's so complex, it's incredible. Um, but of course, we know he's not typical e e either. He's remarkable. Um, he's operating in an extremely racist environment, but he makes his way to success as he defines it for himself through trusted business relationships in his local community, a ton of hard work, and a truly entrepreneurial spirit. And so at the end of his life, he says, uh, Admits all my griefs and pains, I have many consolations. Meg, the wife of my youth, whom I married for love and bought with my money, is still alive. My freedom is a privilege which nothing else can equal. 
I'm now possessed of more than 100 acres of land and three habitable dwelling houses. It gives me joy to think that I have and that I deserve so good a character, especially for truth and integrity. And so when children read this and learn this and they've just read his entire life, they're going to just really <laughs> have such a richer appreciation for the history and the founding of Connecticut, good and bad. I mean, this is not a happy story. As Liz said, there's moments of violence that's illustrated in this book. Um, but his devotion and his singular um, pursuit of the things that he wants and values is just really a wonderful story. So you're, you can purchase a sample of the copy. They're $10 a piece. You can sign up online for a seven-day free trial. You can see the entire book. You can take a look at the lesson plans and such. Um, we do offer discounted copies for districts that are working with the Wit Witness Stones Project. And I have here uh, to, an invitation to talk with our educator, Kristen Levithan, and you see her email there. I think you probably could talk her into a free sample if you're an educator, uh, but we would love to talk with you further about incorporating this into the classroom, into Sunday school classes, library book groups, you know, anywhere where a book discussion uh, about the, this incredible person and this his life story would be um, would be welcome. Uh, we we would love to talk with you. So I want to thank you again to the Connecticut Democracy Center, the, the Old State House, the Connecticut Freedom Trail for inviting us to talk about Venture Smith. And um, I think we can open it up to questions here. I always like to end with this picture that circles us back to Venture Smith Day. This I think was the first one I attended. Uh, these are some of the descendants, um, and I, you know, I thank Carl, who, when we launched the book, invited us to speak at Venture Smith Day, and we've been there, I think, pretty much most of them since, uh, and I appreciate that. But to me, again, that Venture Smith has living, breathing descendants, and is is just again such a wonderful connection, past to present. So thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Stafko, Liz Wood, and Liz Norman. Before we go to the questions, we do have a survey that we would like for you to complete for us so that we can know how we're doing and what other subjects you would like to cover. Um, also, uh, we do have several questions. We'll try to get to as many as we can within the time period we have left. Our first question is, how does the life of Venture Smith compare to other freedom seekers or freed enslaved people in Connecticut? And anyone can answer. <laughs> I, I think Venture, Venture Smith's life is really quite extraordinary. Um, and not only because he left such a tangible evidence of it in his narrative, but the, the success, the financial success he was able to achieve is not typical. There are so many enslaved people that we don't we don't even know their names um we know we know who they were enslaved by but we don't we don't know who their families were whether they experienced happiness joy or or were yeah just abused it's just it, it's not typical at all i would say I, I would just add though that um when connecticut explored when we were doing uh a, a whole issue around the Constitution of 1818. Uh, so not to get too far down a tangent, but in 1814, Connecticut um, added the word white to its voting uh, legislation, its voting requirements. And that, and then it, and, and then it uh, codified that in the Constitution of 1818. So Connecticut operates under, you know, col the colonial, the fundamental orders of 16 something, until 1818, it had already been a state for 30, 40 years. Why did it suddenly, you know, finally do a Constitution 1818 that is, A, silent about slavery, which was still legal in the state, and number two, uh, codify that voters could only be white. So we went looking around. We're like, huh, does that mean black, free blacks could vote before that? Or does that mean it was like one of those un unwritten rules? And Everybody knew black people couldn't vote, but you know now we're going to put it in the state statutes. We did. I've only found two examples, but this speaks to the question. Two men in Wallingford, Connecticut, in the period 1799, I think, in 1803, 
they had were formerly enslaved, were free. They met the property requirements and the good standing requirements in Wallingford to be allowed to be elected as freemen, which is to say voters in Wallingford. And so there's just two examples. In Connecticut at the time, universal suffrage was not a thing. It, it was only reserved for men, then white men, and you had to also have, be property owning and have good standing in the town. So here are two formerly enslaved men who met, met all of those qualifications to be able to vote. So Venture Smith is, and, and maybe these other two men are um, unusual. So we're not talking about a broad experience, but we're not talking about the only. I think, again, because we don't have a lot of historical record, um, we don't know the whole story. But um, so we, I think the answer is somewhere in between. He was extraordinary, certainly not the only person, but, but um, not the majority either. And I remember um, African-Americans were only about 3% of the population in the state, free or enslaved. Um, and so a small percentage of the population really struggling. And as slavery becomes um, illegal, it, and, and Carl talked about this in the second period um, after Venture Smith, like the next generation, it gets harder for African-Americans in the state because racism just sort of fills the gap of what had been a social con control mechanism of slavery. So it doesn't get easier. Slavery goes away and that's a good thing, but it doesn't mean that the struggle wasn't on. And lots of people, there's lots of great stories of uh, African-American people in Connecticut really rallying for civil rights, voting rights throughout this period. So it's, it's, a, it's a complex story. I'll just add that um, in all the discussions I've had with the descendants of Bench Smith, most of them uh, in one way or another knew that they were descended from him because of family stories. But there isn't a single one of them that isn't extremely proud to be a descendant and um, extremely proud of the life that Venture uh, made of his uh, existence. Thank you. It is good to know that he had extraordinary circumstances and he was able to be successful, especially during that time. Uh, we have another question here that says, uh, was he ever in Rhode Island, and if so, where? So was Venture ever in Rhode Island? Yes. He, the first probably six months to a year when he arrived in Rhode Island, lived with the sister of his owner, uh, while that uh, his owner went off to sea again, and that sister, Mercy Dyer, um, probably uh, helped him to learn to speak and uh, uh, taught him uh, a lot of household duties and so forth while he was there. Then after his owner came back, um, his owner took him to live with the rest of the family on Fisher's Island. So he actually did spend at least six months to a year in Newport. Thank you. Uh, let's see, I am researching a man named Dolphin Dart who was enslaved by my ancestors, Ebenezer and Joseph Dart. What is the best source to find out information about other African men enslaved by Haddam, East Haddam families during Venture Smith's time? So what are the sources you could come up with or have used? Uh, church records, the first church congregational records list all of the, um, they were called servants in the church records uh, who became uh, members who were married, baptized, and died um, during that time period. Um, uh, some of them are mentioned in probate records, uh, especially when they were set free. Um, but unless they were free, they could not own land, so they wouldn't have been in, in land records. And basically, there were so few of those at that time it's best to stick with probate and with church records. Okay, another question is, who were the Stonington families that owned him and how did they do after the revolution? And was one of those families treated him and one of the members treated him very poorly? So basically the question is asking, 
who were the Stonington families that owned him? And how did they do after the Revolutionary War? So Venture was owned by the Stanton family as well as the Smith family. Um, and, the, and it was while he was enslaved by the Stantons that he was treated so poorly. Um, I don't know how they do after the revolution um, or if um, I know the Stantons stay in town, but I don't know what happens to the Smith family. So I'm sorry. I don't know. I don't know. Dr. Stafko or Elizabeth? Um, in general, the Smith family developed, uh, Oliver Smith and his son Edward, developed uh, a lot of problems financially, and they did not do well. Um, as far as the Stanton family was concerned, after Thomas Stanton II died, his estate was divided up amongst as many children, most of whom didn't stay and sold their interests in the farm and moved elsewhere. Most of them, uh, a lot of them moved westward to New York. And uh, um, so I wouldn't say that the families did terribly well after Venture left and even after he had passed away. Well, thank you. We have time for just one more. Um, and actually it's a great one. It says, what are some key sites to visit regarding Venture Smith? So what would you recommend as key sites to visit to get more information about Venture? The sites in Stonington include the Lighthouse Museum exhibit. Um, you can visit the exhibit to learn more about Venture Smith's life. Um, you can also visit Barn Island, which is state owned now. It's open to the public. Um, there is no map that shows you where the home site is, but, um, but if you stop here first, we can tell you more about it. And then I think those sites in East Haddam are definitely of interest as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's uh, his, his grave site uh, and the, the uh, family lot in the First Church Cemetery, cemetery uh, is uh, visited quite frequently by people and there's also a historic sign there. The East Haddam Historical Society has a small exhibit on Venture Smith Unfortunately, um, even though uh, he's buried in East Haddam, he didn't really live in East Haddam. He lived on Haddam Neck, which is in Haddam. And his homestead site on Haddam Neck is uh, off limits to everyone. Um, uh, you cannot go there to visit his home site. Well, thank you so very much to the three of you for joining us. But before we go, can you please give us the date in September, which is Venture Smith Day, so that we can get as many visitors as possible that day? It's September 10th, which is the Saturday after Labor Day. Starts at 1 o'clock in First Church Cemetery and lasts until 4 or 5 o'clock. The end of it will be at the um, East Haddam Historical Society, both of these Places are on Town Street in East Chatham, about a mile apart. Um, but it is outside, it is outside. Cemetery, so make sure you bring a chair to sit on. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Dr. Stavko. Thank you, Liz Wood. And thank you, Elizabeth Norman, for bringing thank us you. this presentation today on Venture Smith, a very important person in Connecticut. Again, thank you all for joining us. We appreciate you. And please do not forget to fill out the surveys to let us know what other subjects you would like to talk about, as well as letting us know how we are doing. Our next um, conversation at noon will be August 23rd, where uh, Lynette Fisher and Nicole Thomas from the Joshua Hempstead House will talk about the historical district of the Hempstead of Hempstead Historical District in New London. So we hope to see you again next time here at Conversations at Noon on the Connecticut Freedom Trail. Until the next time. Thank you.